Well, we're here in uh, Joshua chapter 14. If you're with us uh, for the first time or you're recently new on Wednesday nights, Wednesday nights we go verse by verse through a book of the Bible. We're going through the book of Joshua. We've come to the place here in chapter 14, which basically deals with, and the chapters following, the division of the land. Remember that when God originally promised the land of Israel to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants, uh, that they would uh, have 400 years of slavery in Egypt before they would really possess the land. And God miraculously delivered them out of slavery in Egypt after 400 years, brought them into the promised land, and then they, through a series of uh, military campaigns, will lay hold of the land that God had promised on oath to them. And the Israelites will defeat one king after another until they finally have taken possession of the land as God intended. And uh, as, as they begin to occupy the land in the section we're here in Joshua, the land begins to become divided according to the different tribes of Israel. Remember that there are, there, as you study the formation of the Jewish people, that God formed this race of Jewish people out of nothing. They didn't exist uh, prior to God simply calling Abraham a Gentile pagan to follow after him and to go to a land that God would show him. Abraham was living in, if you look on a map today, it would have been Iraq. And God calls Abraham, Abram at the time, out of Iraq, leads him to the promised land. By faith, Abraham goes, not even knowing where he's going to end up. He comes to the place of Hebron in Israel, and it is there that God shows him, this is the land that I will give to your descendants. Well, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons. And out of these 12 sons will come 12 tribes that make up the whole nation of Israel. Each of the Jewish uh, men and women belong to a certain tribe, and uh, de depending on whatever son they descended from. Now, there's a little bit of a... Um, uh, of, of a of a change within the 12 sons, and then we'll see it here in chapter 14. So I just want to uh, remind you again before we read this, that out of the 12 sons, um, not each of the 12 necessarily got a land allotment because there were two exceptions. Uh, the, the son Levi and his descendants, the Levites, were not given land uh, because their inheritance was the Lord. They would be given Levitical cities, but they would not be given a territory of land. And the other exception is Joseph is one of Jacob's sons. And Joseph will actually receive a double blessing. And so Levi is removed from the 12 as far as land allotment. Joseph is removed. Now you have 10, but two of Joseph's sons receive his inheritance. So uh, Ephraim and Manasseh then make out the, the 12. So there's a little bit of an exception there among the 12, but as we get into chapter 14, you'll see it spelled out a little bit uh, more clearly here. Now, just to, again, orient us, here's the map uh, that we've been working from. This is uh, the land of Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee to the north, the Dead Sea. It'll be called the Salt Sea in, in the chapter we're going to read tonight. The Jordan River connects the two going north to south. Uh, if you remove the wording, this is what we covered last week. So two and a half tribes are going to get their land allotment on the eastern side of the Jordan River in what today would be the land of Jordan, the country of Jordan. You have the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh. The other half is going to live on the eastern uh, side of the uh, Jordan River, uh, sorry, the western side of the Jordan River. And so when you look at the other nine and a half tribes located on the western side of the Jordan River, the land allotment gets split up something like this. The only thing you have to worry about tonight as we read through chapter 14 and 15 is the southern area that is given to the tribe of Judah. And you'll also note with me when we read chapter 14 that there's a particular region or city called Hebron that also is important for us to see tonight as well. Uh, Hebron today is located in what would be called the West Bank, uh, but it is so it is primarily a Palestinian territory. But uh, when God first distributed it, uh, you'll see it ends up going to Caleb in particular. So take a look here at chapter 14 now and look at verse 1. It says, These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan 
which is what the land of Israel was called uh, prior to it being named Israel because the Canaanites were the principal people who occupied it. The land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and the half tribe. So, nine and a half on the western side of the Jordan River, two and a half on the eastern side that makes up the whole 12. Uh, by the way, notice there that they would cast lots to determine what tribe would get what territory. It is kind of like rolling the dice. And don't look at that and think, well, that's a biblical model. No, not really. Back in the Old Testament times, God would actually give favor. This was a way for them to discern the will of God and that God would actually use the casting of the lots as a way to communicate and speak and to confirm uh, His will. Uh, but when you get to the New Testament, casting the lots have been replaced by the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now you don't need to, you know, flip a coin to try to figure out God's will. Please don't if you do that. You know, don't, don't be flipping coins. What you need to be doing is getting on your knees and praying and asking the Holy Spirit to bear witness to your heart about what God's will is. Now we've been given His Spirit so we can discern His will. In that day, before the Holy Spirit was distributed upon all flesh as it is today among those who accept Christ as Savior, they were relying upon another method for God to speak to them. And it was the casting of the lots or the rolling of, of the lots here. And so that's how they figured out the tribal divisions here. And uh, it says in verse 3, for Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of the Jordan, but to the Levites he had given no inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph, here we go, for the children of Joseph were two tribes. Here are his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So, jo so Joseph himself is taken out, his two sons are brought in, but because Levi is also taken out, you still have 12. But when you look at a map, you're not going to see Levi mentioned, you're not going to see Joseph mentioned. They're out, but Joseph gets a double blessing with Manasseh and Ephraim. And they gave no part to the Levites in the land except cities to dwell in with their common lands for their livestock and their property. As the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. All right, now into verse 6, you're going to see a wonderful tribute to Caleb. And we're going to talk about him tonight. I want to get through uh, chapter 15. I know it looks like a lot, but I'm going to be skipping a lot of the names that are mentioned there that give the boundary territory. So we'll get through it. But uh, take a look here at verse 6. It says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the, made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. Underline that in your Bibles or highlight it. It's going to be repeated two more times. I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever. Because you have, here it is again, wholly followed the Lord my God. And now... Behold, the Lord has kept me alive. This is Caleb still talking. As he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, 
and that the cities were great and fortified, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. That's the end of his little spiel there. It says, and Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day because he wholly, here's the third time, he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. We'll talk more about that. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. All right, so I read a lot there, but let's back up and, and understand what we just read here. Um, Joshua is God's appointed man to be leading the Israelites at this particular time. He has succeeded Moses. Moses has gone on to be with the Lord and Joshua has led the military campaigns and now he's also leading the distribution of the land allotment. And um, he's gotten uh, done with allotting the land on the eastern side of the Jordan River to the two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad and, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh. And now he's ready to cast the lot to divide the land for the other nine and a half tribes on the western side of the Jordan River. When before that happens, Caleb steps forward. He goes, just, just a minute, Josh, just a minute. Before you go casting the lot and dividing all the land here to the nine and a half tribes on the western side of the Jordan River, I want to cash in my coupon. Moses gave me a coupon a long time ago. In fact, 45 years ago. I'm 85 now. And he promised me that the Lord had said to him, wherever my foot trods, uh, I am entitled to it. And so I want you to give me, and what he ends up getting is Hebron. That's why I've highlighted it on the map here. Now, I want you to notice before we talk more about that, that it, sa it says to us uh, back in verse 6 that Caleb was the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite. This, uh, this is only, um, you know, this, the, when, you, when you look at the, the times that we read about Caleb, the first time we're introduced to Caleb is Numbers chapter 13. Uh, then the last time we've heard of him is Deuteronomy chapter 1, and now here. The first time we're introduced to Caleb is in Numbers 13 when Moses selects one spy from each of the 12 tribes to do a recon mission into the promised land and come back and report what is there. What, is, what does the land look like in, term of, in terms of topography and geography and particularly in terms of the people? What kind of people are there? Are, are, are they gonna you know, be waging war against us? Are we gonna have a difficult time fighting them and all this kind of stuff? One of the people that he chooses among the, the 12 spies is Caleb. He is of the tribe of Judah. His name in Hebrew, Kalev, means dog. So, I, you know, he must have been fierce, okay? He's a fierce fighter, as we will see here. I mean, the guy's 85, and he says, I'm still strong enough for war. So, you know, he's, he's like, you know, he's got that tenacity of like a dog, all right? So, that's his name, Kalev, dog. And it tells us that his father's name was Jephunneh, there in verse 6, the Kenizzite. Now, this is interesting because in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 19, the Bible tells us that the Kenizzites were part of the tribal people who lived in the land of Canaan among the Canaanites, meaning that the Kenizzites were not Jews. The Kenizzites were pagan Gentile people. And that Caleb has descended, at least on his father's side, from the Kenizzites. So Bible scholars believe that at some point the Kenizzites became proselytes to Judaism. Uh, and it's a debate as to when that actually happened. This much we do know, Caleb was a slave in Egypt. So he had to have been numbered among the Hebrews when he lived in Egypt. So at some point prior to that, and Bible scholars think that what happened was, when the initial group of Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, went to Egypt initially to escape a famine in the land of Israel, 
that the Kenizzites, perhaps also living there in the land of Israel, in the land of Canaan, went with that initial group of Hebrew people to escape the same famine, to go down to Egypt, where the Egyptians had a stockpile of resources, thanks in part to Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob. And so that at some point, the Kenizzites then intermarry and become proselytes among the Hebrew people. And what scholars believe is that Caleb's mother was probably among those of the tribe of Judah, that she was Jewish, and that clearly his father was a Kenizzite and he was not Jewish but he becomes a proselyte to Judaism because we see Caleb here is a part of the tribe of Judah. But again, more likely through his mother's lineage. Did you know that today, if you want to understand if you are actually Jewish, you trace your Jewish genealogy through your mother, not your father. It is traced through the mother because in part, dads would die in war. And then it would be sometimes hard to distinguish what tribe do you belong to. So it was always distinguished through the mother today to determine what tribe one belongs to. Now among the Jews today, because of the diaspora, the dispersion, and because of the Holocaust, most Jews today don't know to which tribe they belong. With the exception of the if, if you are a Jewish person with the last name Cohen or Levi, then it is probably likely that you belong to the tribe of Levite and that the name was preserved because Cohen means priest and that was part of the, the Levitical line. Uh, but other than that, most Jews today don't know what tribe they belong to. Now, at some point in the future, um, the Jews do begin to understand uh, how it happens, we don't know. But when you read the book of Revelation that we studied just a few months ago, there are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that make up the 144,000 who are part of the witnesses that God uses. So at some point, again, the Jews will understand their tribal lineage. But presently, Jews today uh, rarely will be able to tell you what tribe they belong to. Caleb here is unique in the sense that his dad was a descendant among Gentile pagans, somehow became proselyte to Judaism, his mom likely of the tribe of Judah, and here Caleb is now uh, wonderfully incorporated into uh, Judaism. But he was a slave in Egypt with the Hebrew slaves. And he is one who comes out of slavery with the rest of the Hebrews when they were delivered out of slavery in Egypt. And the Bible tells us by Caleb's own testimony here, he was 40 years old when Moses tapped him on the shoulder to be a spy from the tribe of Judah to go into the promised land. And now it is 45 years later. So we can do a little math here and realize what happens is he's 40 when he comes out of Egypt because that's when he's a spy. He spends 40 more years wandering with the Hebrew people until an entire generation dies, except for himself and Joshua, who will go into the promised land. So he's 40 when he comes out. He's 40 more years in the Sinai, in the wilderness wanderings, and now he's 85, which means that the fighting we've been reading about in the first 13 chapters of Joshua covers about five years. He's 40 when he comes out, another 40 wandering in the wilderness, five more years of fighting, and so now he's 85 and he's ready to cash in his retirement plan. And he says to Joshua, I want you to select for me the land that I'm entitled to. And so he gets here Hebron. Now uh, it's mentioned there in verse 13. And so Joshua blessed him, said, yes, you're right. Um, Moses promised this to you because the Lord said, uh, you are faithful and so you get Hebron. Now, um, again, today Hebron is part of the Palestinian area in the, the West Bank, but Hebron has significant Jewish roots. As I mentioned at the top of the Bible study, when God led Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldees, out of Iraq to the Promised Land, the first place that Abraham settles is Hebron. In fact, it will also be the place where Abraham is buried. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, uh, their son, Isaac, and his wife, Rebekah, are buried also in Hebron, as are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's wife, Leah. 
They're all buried in Hebron there. There is a tomb today, the tomb of the patriarchs, um, and it is supposedly the tomb where they are buried, but it, it is, it is you know, not clearly known whether or not uh, that's reliable. But we do know from Scripture that Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah are buried there in Hebron. So it, it almost seems as if Caleb, um, you know, being this sort of proselyte to Judaism, Abraham himself was not a Jew. The Jewish race came from his seed. Caleb is like, you know, finding this similarity with, I want the land that our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob settled in and are buried in. This is where my foot has walked. This is where I want to lay claim. And so this is where he ends up living. Uh, by the way, about 400 years after uh, Caleb comes David. And King David will spend the first seven and a half years of his reign reigning from Hebron because Jerusalem is not yet taken from the Jebusites, as we'll see at the end of, of uh, chapter 15. So let me keep reading into chapter 15. So this was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah according to their families. And this is where we get into some lengthy stuff here. I'll only read a little bit of this. The border of Edom at the wilderness of Zin southward was the extreme southern boundary. And their southern border began at the shore of the Salt Sea, that's the Dead Sea, from the bay that faces southward. Then it went out to the southern side of the ascent of Akrabim, passed along to Zin, ascended on the north side of Kadesh Barnea, passed along to Hezron, went up to Adar, and went around to Karka. From there it passed toward Asmon, and went out to the brook of Egypt, and the border ended at the sea. That's the Mediterranean. This shall be your southern border. The east border was the Salt Sea as far as the mouth of the Jordan. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to just, they keep you know, Joshua keeps describing here the border the, and all of these names that I'm going to butcher. So I'm going to spare you from all of that. And then you can just jump to verse 12, where it says the west border was the coastline of the Great Sea. That's the Mediterranean. And this is the boundary of the children of Judah all around according to their families. Now, verse 13. Now to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So we're not done with Caleb here yet. He gave a share among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. Remember, when the Anakim were, the, were this race of giants. Uh, and Kirjath means uh, city. So it was originally, it was actually originally called Hebron. And then at some point it was renamed Kirjath Arba after this giant Arba. And then it's going to be named Hebron again. And it says in verse 14, Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there. So these are part of the giant race. Now just picture this. Caleb's 85 years old. All right. But he still has the strength of a young man. And he's going to whip giants here. Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. And then he went up from there to the inhabitants of Debir. Formerly, the name of Debir was Kiryath Sefer. And notice this. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kiryath Sefer and takes it, to him I will give Achsa, my daughter, as wife. Now, listen, he just, he just whipped a few giants, okay? He could take this city, but he puts out a challenge. He's like, because he's courageous and bold, he wants other people to be courageous and bold. He's like, I'm 85. I just whipped three giants. Who wants my daughter for marriage? You take the next city. <laughs> That's what he does here. So Othniel, verse 17, the son of Canaz, the brother of Caleb, took it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. Now, have you, did you sort through the little family tree right there? This is Caleb's brother's son. So this is Caleb's nephew. And Caleb gives his daughter to his nephew. Kissing cousins, that's what they are. 
So now you know where Curiosity Fair is. It's just down Route 9. <laughs> so, verse 18, now it was so that when she came to him, that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. Look, they're barely married, and she's like, buy me something. All right. <laughs> Go ask my dad. Buy me a field. But listen, she herself, she's got some chutzpah, because look, so she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, what do you wish? And she answered, so now, now look, before I read what she answered, she says to her husband, go ask dad for a field. I'm going to ask him, and here's what she asks for. Give me a blessing, since you have given me land in the south, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. So I just love this, you know, around Caleb, it's just this sense of like, he's bold and he's courageous. He wants people around him to be bold and courageous. Who wants to take Curious Affair? Othniel, okay, I'll give you my daughter. And then the daughter's like, I want to be bold and courageous too. I want to ask for the springs. You gave me some land, give me some water to go with it. So he's like, all right, and here you go. And this was the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah according to their families. Now, I'll skip all the cities here. You're going to read roughly a hundred towns and villages. You're welcome. <laughs> but if you look at the last verse, and then don't rush out because I got, I got one more thing to do. But at the last verse of chapter 15, as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. So I'll put Jerusalem up on the map as, as a little final location for us to be able to see there. That's, that's where Jerusalem is located. And it will remain in the hands of the Jebusites for 400 more years until David and his general Joab will end up taking Jerusalem and defeating the Jebusites. So they don't lay claim to it. That's why David has to spend the first seven and a half years of his reign in Hebron until he can dislodge the Jebusites and then they take over Jerusalem. I want you to go back to chapter 15, uh, 14 for just a moment because I, I want to focus on the last few minutes on this phrase, Caleb wholly followed the Lord. It's mentioned three times there in chapter 14, verse 8, verse 9, and verse 14. It's mentioned three other times about Caleb in the, between the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. So six times altogether, the Bible talks about how Caleb was someone who wholly followed the Lord. Some of your translations say, wholeheartedly followed the Lord. And when I think about the example that he sets in that regard, what does it mean to wholly follow the Lord? And there's four quick things I want to share that I think are um, indicative of uh, Caleb's life. And the first one is this. It tells us in Numbers 14, 24, a very interesting statement that God makes about Caleb, that both he and Joshua had a different spirit. They had a different spirit. And when I think about that, I think that's in part why he was able to wholly follow the Lord. What, what do I mean? I believe that if you really want to wholly follow the Lord, wholeheartedly follow the Lord, you have to be willing to be different. You have to be willing to be different. You have to be willing to accept that in wholly following the Lord, you will belong to a minority of people. Caleb and Joshua were only two spies out of 12 who gave a good report when they first spied out the land. 10 of the 12 gave a bad report, and that's why fear spread through the whole Israelite community. Because 10 gave a bad report seeing giants in the land and thinking there's no way we can defeat them, and fear and dread spread among the Hebrew people. Only Joshua and Caleb were, were the two out of the 12 spies who said, no, 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 no. No, no, we can do this. See, they were different. They were different. And in order to really wholly follow the Lord, we have to understand, as Peter would say in 1 Peter 2, 11, we are aliens and strangers in this world. Uh, some translations say we're sojourners and pilgrims. Now, we don't belong here. So we should feel different and we should be different. Now, I don't, I'm not saying be weird. There's unfortunately some Christians who are just plain weird. 
They, and they just seem to like to be weird. I don't mean different weird. I mean different devoted. <laughs> devoted to God. In this sense, if, if you are more interested in fitting in and being accepted and being liked by people, you will never wholly follow the Lord. If you're more concerned about fitting in and being liked by people, then you will never wholly be able to follow the Lord. There's this different thing about Caleb. He was unlike just the average person, and so should we if we want to be wholly following after the Lord. Another thing that I think stands out about Caleb's life is he believed what God said. He believed what God said. That's one of the reasons why he didn't see any obstacles when he went into the promised land as a spy, because he knew that God was with them. And so if God is for us, and who can be against us? And so he believed what God said. And as a result of believing what God said, it tells us in Numbers 13, he gave a little speech to the, to the Hebrew people. It says in Numbers 13, verse 30, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. You have this sense that Caleb was just like, well, if God said it, I believe it. And so that settles it. And Caleb was, you know, just this kind of a guy who took God at his word and believed what God said. In fact, three times in chapter 14, three times between verses 6 and 12, he, he quotes God. He says, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said. So he always was taking God at face value and believing what God said. Number three, he lived how God said. Caleb demonstrated uncompromising obedience to God. There is no record, no footnote that Caleb, you know, went AWOL or, you know, he went off the rails and, you know, in the decade of his 70s, he started womanizing and getting drunk. None of that. It, it, was, it was a, now I'm sure he struggled like everybody else, but there's, there's nothing in the scriptures that indicate indicate to us that he rebelled against God or, or, or that he forsook the Lord. In fact, quite the opposite. It tells us that he consistently walked with God and he was faithful to the Lord because he lived how God said. And then the last thing that I think makes him a man who wholly followed the Lord is that he waited for when God said, when God said. There was a patience and a perseverance about his life that I think is admirable because it tells us there in chapter 14 that he waited 45 years for God to deliver on his promise. 45 years. In fact, he even says there in verse 10 of chapter 14, the Lord kept me alive as he said these 45 years. So he's, he's 40 when he comes out of Egypt as a slave spends another 40 years in the wilderness wandering and five more years fighting, but he knows that God is faithful, so it's just a matter of when. And so he's just going to be patient, and he's going to persevere, he's going to wait upon the Lord, and God delivers in God's time, but God is always faithful to his promises. And I just love how patient Caleb is here for the when of God's promises. It's not just what, it's when. And he is a man who is patient to wait 45 years. So for all these reasons, and probably others, but I think they are good reminders to us. If we want to be men and women who wholly follow after the Lord, we have to be willing to be different in our culture especially. We have to believe what God says. Uh, we have to live how God says. And we have to be patient and wait for when God says, and in that way be wholly devoted to Him. Father, we thank You for Your Word. And we thank You for the example of Caleb, a man who was true to You, who wholly followed You. And so we thank You for an example, just a, a regular person who had no doubt regular struggles uh, but we can 
also aspire to be men and women who wholly follow after you as well. May we be different. Different in the sense, Lord, that we aren't interested in the acceptance of man, but we're interested in your acceptance and approval. We want to please you, Lord. We want to live for you. We want to honor you and obey you, and we want to follow after you. And so we put our faith in you and our trust in you. And we thank you for this time in your word tonight. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.